to another planet? Welcome to fucking space! Oh, fantastic. You've decided to take a look around, little kitty. Oh, my God! Oh, no, 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 I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear when you walked over here. You want to come or what? Fucking hell yeah, we'll buy some alien cum. <laughs> okay, that intro. What up, everybody? I'm Pants404. I'm here with Cultural Rogue and Fear Agent, and we are Entertainment Value. Today, we're here to talk about High on Life, a comedy FPS shooter from Squanch Games with some of the best comedians and voice actors in Hollywood. From the mind of Justin Roiland comes this hilarious adventure that wastes no time letting you know the amount of not suitable for work content it's willing to dish out, as you can obviously tell. This is a great comedy game, and it's non-stop laughs and action that's broken up by some pretty quality content that lands like some of the best jokes in Rick and Morty, while it pokes fun of the shortcomings of the gaming industry. This is one of those story games where little decisions mean big impacts later. Who knows what NPCs will die because you let me shit into the pipes into my friend's mouth. Alright, I think you get it. Let's hop into the business model. In 2016, Justin Roiland, co-creator of Rick and Morty and Solar Opposites, teamed up with Tanya Watson, an executive producer for games such as Gears of War 2 and 3, Bulletstorm, and Fortnite. Together, they formed Squanch Games. Initially, Squanch was focused on VR gaming and released three titles in the VR format, which are generally a lot shorter by design. VR games tend to be under 10 hours long. Now, Tanya Watson ended up stepping down from her CEO role in early 2021. It's our understanding that she is still around in an advisory capacity. The reason why she stepped down aren't really clear, but the details aren't really that important. What's important to consider here is that the gaming industry side of Foundership just wasn't there for the development of High on Life. This helps to paint a picture as to why the game turned out the way that it did. With Justin Roiland as sole CEO, Squanch's experience is built around VR-specific and mobile games, as well as TV show content creation. Squanch currently lacks experience with how to implement Roiland's vision into a standard game format, and certain talking points in our review will reflect that. Even though Roiland is finding himself in some hot water right now, he's clearly a great visionary whose style and universe building has effectively shaped comedy and culture in a big way. Another part of Squanch's business model worth mentioning here is their lack of transparency. Since launch, High on Life has been patched, but all information on the game is relegated to their official website and Twitter effectively forcing the user to do some digging and go to them directly for patch notes, updates, and news. It's disappointing that they operate with zero due diligence in connecting with their community on platforms where their products are being sold. A big chunk of their fan base exists on Steam and Epic Game Store, and Squanch should be engaging them there. Justin, my dude, people love your stuff. We think it would behoove you to have some kind of presence in the communities that your game connects you to. You're killing it on Game Pass right now. Which, by the way, folks, we highly recommend as a way to play this game. This isn't an ad for Microsoft, but regardless of our verdict, it's just hands down the cheapest way to experience the game for yourself. Anyways, the point is that Squanch should show some love to Steam and Epic Game Store folks who are paying full price. It's just a matter of common fucking courtesy. Speaking of transparency, let's talk about marketing and launch. There really wasn't much marketing involved with the launch of High on Life. In fact, we didn't even know about the game until Gamescom over the summer and didn't really see any hype around the game until the weeks leading up to launch. While the marketing was solid when they had it, they had very little social media presence. In fact, as mentioned before, you generally had to go to Squanch Games directly to get any info around High on Life. Now, all that being said, this tactic seems to have worked really well as during launch, High on Life has become a surprise hit, hitting the top of popularity charts on Games Pass and getting glowing reviews on Steam. There are some overcritical critic reviews saying the launch was a buggy mess, but compared to most launches these days, this was actually a pretty solid launch on Squanch's side. Now, it did launch with several game-breaking bugs, like some players were stuck perpetually in Space Applebee's, and there are some areas where you can get stuck in the game with no way to get out, and even trying to load the last checkpoint, unfortunately, you're kind of stuck where you are, and you might be forced to restart the game. 
And of course, with Squanch being as self-aware as they are, they made light of the situation, letting you know right at the beginning of the game that all bugs are there by intention. Now, that might not really remove the sting of restarting a game, but it sure softens the blow, and it definitely makes you understand why there is such a strong support in the community for this. Okay, let's talk about data. In the first two weeks post-launch, we can see that there's a clear decline in players and viewers, but how does that compare to the rest of the industry? If we compare to relatable games like Tiny Tina's Wonderland and Grounded, we can see that week over week, High on Life loses 24% of its player base, while Tiny Tina only loses 2%, and Grounded actually gains 14% more players. Overall, it's a 32% greater decline against comparable games. Viewership saw an even larger decline week over week, as they saw 57% of total viewership drop across Twitch, which is pretty comparable to Tiny Tina's viewership, a game that was arguably received far worse than High on Life. So why is High on Life performing so poorly? Well, there's two obvious answers. The first is the majority of players are playing on Games Pass, and unfortunately, we don't have access to that data. We've only got Steam. Now, if anybody's watching has access to that data or knows how to get it for us, we'd love to hear about it. The other is, while High on Life is an excellent game, it suffers from very little content. Of the 80 FPS releases in 2022, it comes in at the 17th shortest, with the 18th game, Neon White, having almost double the content. So it's no surprise that while High on Life at launch was the second most popular item on Steam, it quickly dropped to the 64th within a few weeks as players steered towards Game Pass or finished watching all available content on Twitch. And of course, we would never legally tell you to do this, but no surprise here, looking at pricing data, if you found High on Life outside the US in an English speaking country and happen to have a VPN, you can save a lot of money. Let's take a second to talk about customization. The PC requirements are pretty forgiving. A low-end machine can run this game very well. But running well or not, there are a few standard customization settings that you'd expect in a modern game to have that are missing. Like no support for HDR, and it's lacking some key audio mixing settings. As far as optimization, it's fine, but we found it annoying that it didn't have any NVIDIA or AMD recommended settings. There are a few less annoying ones, but we'll put those in a full list that you can check out if you're interested. The UI isn't perfect, but it works well enough. Sometimes there are pointless things on the UI like ammo in an infinite ammo game that just kind of adds to the clutter, but as useless as it was, your UI companion, the sci-fi clippy guy, is a solid joke and a welcome one. I just wanted to say, you know, today really meant a lot to me and um, uh, God, uh, this is so fucking hard. High on Life's graphics and stylization is very reflective of Justin Roiland's established style of universe building. Anyone familiar with his co-created IPs like Rick and Morty or Solar Opposites will immediately feel right at home when diving into this game. While we feel that the design on the human characters felt a little off and out of place, the diverse cast of alien characters were incredibly well done. Full of bright colors, comical emotional expressions, and a great blend of cartoon features and pseudo-realistic textures. The locations and world building are pretty great. Throughout the core of the game, exploration felt really engaging and immersive. For sound design, we did run into some desyncing issues and had moments where dialogue was interrupted by tracks trying to occupy the same space. Overall, however, the sound felt pretty great. In the name, they support whoa, 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 hey, tough whoa, guy, whoa, whoa. hey, look, walk away if you want. This is a fucking Mac and Cheese Brothers construction site. The sound effects for the environment, abilities, and world interactions were remarkably well done. Even though we totally understand that interplanetary, extra-dimensional dick and fart jokes are kind of Roiland's thing, Sound-wise, a little too heavy on the farts. Hey, sorry, yeah, no, he can't talk. He just sort of makes that noise. Where sound really shines the most is in the dialogue and the talented cast of voice actors. Said cast was utilized very well in the game's storytelling. We've all made mistakes. I mean, not Kenny-level planet-wide genocide mistakes, but... While sentient weapons and items aren't a new concept to gaming, we feel the way that concept was utilized in this game as a central theme was actually innovative in the way it was applied. To introduce a colorful cast of companions to share in the journey while having unique reactions to the world around them was fantastically well done, and Squanch deserves kudos for not only bringing that approach to storytelling, but also doing it in a way that feels great and entertaining. Which is the other big strong point that High on Life has going for it. We can tell you for certain that without question, this game is super entertaining. Need some motivation to keep going? How about an award? 
Here, take this one that says you spent all your in-game playtime at an alien strip club. Oh, that's permanent, by the way. Everyone on your friends list can see that forever now. The game's story starts you out as a typical low-life teenager. You go outside with Big Sis and immediately witness an alien invasion. Which are these pieces of shit called the G6 Cartel, who've invaded Earth to harvest the human race to consume as drugs. Which is the meaning behind the title of the game, you know, getting high on life. They seem to only smoke beings who have hair. I mean, any good chronic is going to have some orange or red hair on it, so it makes sense, I guess? This green is Soylent, though, you know, cause it's people. Anyways, in the midst of the chaos, you find Kenny, a being known as a Gatlian, who begins guiding you on your adventure. You end up fighting off a wave of invaders and hooking up an alien device which allows you to teleport your entire house to another planet. Once there, Kenny instructs you to find a renowned bounty hunter named Gene Zeruthian to ask for aid in your quest. Turns out Gene is a homeless vet who clearly got fucked up from bounty hunting. He has no legs and has a limp dick dead as fuck third eye as his war wounds. He sees your nice house as an opportunity to join the team, gives you a suit, and starts you on your way to taking on the mantle of bounty hunter. And that's the rest of the game. You're the bounty hunter, G6 Cartel is the bounty, and you progressively meet new Gatlians in your adventure, who join your team and have biological abilities that aid you in combat and exploration. It's a lot of fun, and the voice actors did a fantastic job of bringing the world to life. Now, we don't want to spoil too much of the story itself, so we'll end things there. However, it's worth noting that in regards to story, this game is packed with content that with a few exceptions has no real connection to the overarching storyline. I mean, there are literally like full length feature films, whole songs, witty banner from NPCs, and a large loop of television programs, which is fantastic, highly entertaining, and really adds a lot to the overall experience. You, they'll kill your mean boss, your ex-husband, anybody, doesn't matter. Just come on down to Gene Zaruthian's Bounty Hunting Emporium. It's the weird house in the middle of Blimp City Plaza, right near Porto's. If a weird girl yells at you, just walk right past her. She's not important. The problem is that if you're sitting on the couch with Gene, watching a movie in the theater, or just hanging out on the corner listening to an indie rock song about cheese and toast, you're forced into the perspective of a viewer and not a player. I mean, why do you even have a controller in your hand? I think you get the point. Lots of time spent doing nothing. Our job is to measure the value a gamer gets out of a game. The times where no gaming is happening is too subjective to properly measure in any way other than the impact on overall experience. And that leads us to the gameplay loop. Unfortunately, this is the weakest part of High on Life. Really, the guns feel very lackluster, there's very low variety in enemies, even missions, and really things to do in general. While the comedy sort of keeps you going in the background, which is fantastic, the actual actions that you're taking are pretty much the same throughout the entire game. We actually found it useless to use anything other than the knife and pistol that you get in the first five minutes of the game for probably 90% of the entire storyline. And the reason for that is that the knife is very effective and so is the pistol. The shotgun unfortunately isn't effective outside of knifing range and the needler, well, it's a needler. Now, Creature was pretty cool because you can take control of some enemies, but to be completely honest with you, it was only situationally useful. And that's an issue, because a lot of the content in this game that could affect the gameplay loop is using those guns. And on top of that, the challenge level of this game is very low. We found even on the highest difficulty, we had no issues Leroy Jenkinsing into any mob in the game. The only folks that gave us any kind of challenge was maybe a boss or two along the way. And with that, about six hours into the game, you've pretty much fought and seen everything that this game has to offer outside of those bosses. All right. Negatives aside, this game is really freaking cool. It's one of the funniest games that we've ever played. It's got the best comedic voice acting we've ever seen, and that really adds to some replayability. You can start a new character and choose different dialogue paths to get more humor. Now, just don't expect an endgame plus, as that hasn't arrived yet. Okay, let's talk about community and plan support. We'll start off with something good by saying that there is no toxicity to speak of for this game. And why would there be? It's a single player experience and everyone just seems to want a little bit more. Speaking of more though, if there was any planned DLC or constant updates, you would barely know it due to there not being any roadmap for this game. And the few hints that they have dropped are unfortunately not confirmed yet. 
As far as the frequency of these updates, it's kind of at a trickle, but the quality of them is very good. We've been impressed with them addressing a lot of the game-breaking issues immediately that many of us have been facing, like the Applebee's and the jetpack bugs. They've also addressed a lot of other various progression issues that many players have been faced with. So while they aren't updating quickly, they do have the overall game in mind. And by updating many quality of life issues as well, they are thinking about the player. There are a few bugs that we were going to really stick it to them with, but they have actually cleaned up the game quite a bit since release. Which is good for them, because with no multiplayer to speak of, we can't be very forgiving on a buggy mess after launch. And who wants to play a buggy single player game anyways, right Bethesda? On the flip side, bugs were there at launch, and one thing we are finding annoying with these patch notes is that they aren't player forward and don't have our best interests in mind. When they finally do release, they aren't on the Steam page. Is there an echo in here? Is there an echo in here? All right, let's wrap this up. Now we're going to kick this off by giving you our pros and cons. We're going to talk about our price, give you some final thoughts, and then we're going to look at what's the most common user feedback and does this game actually meet the hype? All right, let's talk about the pros. This game is hilarious. It's easily the funniest game we've played since Stick of Truth. It's incredibly immersive and it has innovative storytelling that goes beyond normal NPCs. It's also got top shelf voice acting with some of the funniest people in Hollywood. The level design is just fun, and overall, this game is just cool as fuck. Okay, let's talk about the cons. This game is unfortunately really short, it's literally the 17th shortest game in the genre. The gunplay is weak, and the combat is low challenge, with low variation in enemies and environments. We also lack transparency in a roadmap, with poor optimization, and unfortunately, just a lack of core content throughout the game. Okay, let's talk about our price. Drum roll, please. $44.23. Now, High on Life was able to do this because it's one of our favorite comedy games of all time, and it's a steal if you're playing on Game Pass. However, it doesn't come close to bringing in a $60 value for the average gamer. And it does go without saying that, hey, if you're a gamer that doesn't like Rick and Morty or Solar Opposites, this game's probably not for you. Now, how can they raise that price? Easily, the biggest way they can do so is just increase the value of the game by giving us more content. Improve the gunplay. That shotgun has no punch, and the needler, well, it's a needler. Now, we'd also love to see more of a challenge and a bit more variation with enemies and environments, and some kind of clearly defined roadmap for DLCs. Now let's take a look at the most common user feedback. It's a great game, but it's too short and not worth the money. Couldn't have said it better ourselves. Now, wrapping this up, does the game actually meet the hype? Well, the game had no hype, so yeah, it kind of did, and it had a surprise success because of it, so we got to give them kudos here. Now, as always, we're going to revisit High on Life down the road and update its value then. Until then, please like and subscribe and hit that bell. We'll see you next time on Entertainment Value.